so uh, basically you see on the bottom right the, uh, one of the instruments uh, that LIGO has built and it has these perpendicular four kilometer arms where you have masses uh, suspended in vacuum and basically the idea was that if a gravitational wave passes through the earth it would reflect uh, the shape of uh, change the shape of these masses and uh, that uh, this change of shape would be detected uh, by the, the, the main station here in the middle. Um, LIGO was built in two phases. There was the first phase in 2002 and ended in 2010. It was basically a training phase, building the basic detector, developing the analytical uh, pipelines to do uh, computations and analysis on the data. And uh, in fact, what we did in 2010, the LIGO collaboration uh, secretly injected a signal, a fake gravitational wave signal, into the data to see if the collaboration would pick it up. Um, and indeed, they, they had. So they used them um, and they used uh, some of our tools that are described here uh, to do this, um, to pass this uh, brand injection test. And then uh, the detector was uh, upgraded to be much more sensitive. Right now it's four times as sensitive as it was before, and the idea is to make it even more sensitive uh, than that. And we started connect uh, collecting data uh, in September of last year, and then um, after a lot of analysis uh, of the data, they finally announced the detection of the first uh, gravitational wave in uh, February of 2016. And, okay, on the top you see the picture of two... Um, uh, the two massive black holes that uh, coalesced and that created this uh, gravitational wave. And they detected the uh, wave at both uh, instruments, both in Livingston and in Hanford, and you see the graphs of the uh, wave signals on the right. And on the bottom, you see the uh, the two uh, signal uh, put on top of each other, and you see that there is good coherence between the two. Uh, so this was uh, quite a big um, event for LIGO, and uh, one of the things that uh, I found interesting about the uh, so analysis of, of the data was, of course, uh, of interest to us, but even looking at the instrument itself, I, I found the, the project very interesting. If you look, for example, at the sensitivity that they needed to achieve in order to uh, detect the gravitational wave, they needed basically to, it's an equivalent sensitivity to measuring the distance to the nearest star uh, to the accuracy smaller than the width of a human hair. So this is something that's uh, an instrument that's extremely precise. If you look at these um, uh, arms of the instrument, uh, they're actually the world's uh, second largest vacuum chambers. And the, uh, the volume of, uh, of these uh, arms is about the, the size of the, that can fit 11 um, 747 uh, airplanes in them. Um, it's also ultra high vacuum, so when they pump it down, they pump it uh, down to, to very low um, pressure. And it takes about 40 days for them to, to remove uh, the air from, uh, from these vacuum tubes. And uh, obviously, that's uh, just uh, before they can uh, even start collecting any data. And their arms are so long, these four kilometer arms, is that the curvature of the Earth affects them as well. So they needed, to, when they're building the arms, they needed to adjust for that and make sure that they're level uh, to conduct the experiments. So if you look at, uh, so this was a little bit about the instrument. If you look at the behind the scenes of the detection, uh, the detection was done through the use of uh, complex uh, analysis. Uh, at first, they, they saw some signal in the data right away with uh, some quick uh, data analysis and visually. However, this, uh, to be sure that this was actually a gravitational wave signal, uh, they had to do a lot of uh, data cleaning, data analysis, uh, and uh, to, to get the uh, significant statistical significance to the level that they thought um, that they actually uh, achieved the detection. Uh, the computational pipelines were executed primarily on the resources that uh, belong to the collaboration. So they, uh, the collaboration has about 11 large-scale clusters at various institutions, uh, both in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, the data, once it's first collected at the instruments, and then it's replicated throughout the storage resources in the U.S. and Europe. And then uh, they have their software that's installed on these clusters that allows them to move, to access the data, 
um, to schedule the computation. So they use um, a, a grid middleware such as grid FTP for data transfers. And they also use the uh, HD Condor on the clusters to uh, support the computations. And these analysis that were involved in um, uh, detecting the gravitational wave were modeled as scientific workflows. So if you look at uh, the graph on the slide, it basically gives you um, a, a feeling of the type of um, computations that uh, LIGO has conducted. It basically is a direct acoustic graph that shows the various computations that occurred um, on the data collected at various uh, detectors. Uh, if you look at the, the size of these type of graphs, so this is just a part of a graph, uh, the actual uh, computations that the scientists did, did have uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs that need to be uh, computed. Uh, they, um, in this case, they executed these computations in Syracuse and at Albert Einstein Institute in, in Germany. And they, they use uh, our Pegasus software to automate the execution of these tasks that you see in the pipeline. Uh, in terms of how many uh, jobs it actually took to compute, uh, first of all, if you look at uh, the usage of uh, Pegasus for these applications uh, since September 2015 to the detection, uh, they ran about uh, 23,000 uh, Pegasus workflows, uh, which uh, uh, altogether had about uh, 95 uh, million individual tasks. As you will see, Pegasus actually changes these tasks in some ways, so the, the actual number of jobs that were executed were over 53 million jobs to do this, um, to gain confidence that the signal that uh, LIGO detected was indeed a gravitational wave signal. So in my talk, uh, I'll give a little bit some more examples of Pegasus workflows, then I'll describe the Pegasus workflow management system I'll talk about the challenges um, that we have in running uh, workflows in various types of environments, on clusters and distributed systems and in clouds. And then um, I'll talk about some of the solutions that we have to these challenges and talk about our current and future um, research directions. If you're wondering how workflows start, oftentimes scientists start by drawing a workflow uh, on a whiteboard or on a piece of paper. And uh, it, at first, it, it's kind of an interesting process because at first it seems that there is not much to, to a particular workflow. The scientists will say that it has only a few steps. But when you start talking to them and going through the, the workflow itself, you find out that it's, the two steps turn into four or five or even more because there are little steps in between that change the format of the data or do some additional analysis that's uh, not uh, maybe the main analysis that the scientist wants to do, but they, they need they need it as part of the overall workflow. Uh, some workflows can be very simple. So this is a workflow that analyzes data from the uh, Kepler uh, mission, and basically this is just a bag of tasks that uh, takes a light curve and produces uh, some some results. Uh, sometimes uh, you don't deal with the workflows uh, themselves. You actually hide the workflows in a portal interface. This is an example of interface uh, for Open Seas, which is an um, earthquake uh, engineering project. And the scientist just puts in information in a form, and then in the background, the workflow gets generated on the fly and uh, executed on, on, in this case, on the Open Science Grid in the US. Sometimes the environment is uh, complex, so maybe you have a scientist that has its uh, local data, they have also various data repositories. They have a workflow work definition. Uh, they have a local resource, but what they want to do is to make use of the resources that they have available to them either on the campus or potentially uh, available for the national um, cyber infrastructure. In the US, it's uh, the Exceed Open Science Grid project. They might also have access to some um, Department of Energy resources, which also have large-scale computing systems. Mm -hmm. Um, they also have access to cloud resources such as the Amazon Cloud or Google Cloud and uh, also some other academic uh, clouds as well. And so the issue is how do you take this work definition, what the scientists want to do and, and the data and, uh, and the data that they need to access and make use of all these resources that are available to them. Um, so in our, uh, uh, sometimes when you look at this environment, uh, the, um, also the workflow workload that, that scientists has could be this uh, simple periodogram workflow which has single core 
computations. However, they get an allocation on Titan, which is a, a HPC system at the Oak Ridge National Lab, which is a Cray XK7, uh, which is um, designed basically to, to support parallel MPI codes. Uh, still, you got an allocation on, on the system and you want to be able to run the workload that, that, uh, that you have, which uh, has you know, thousands or millions of tasks. However, they don't exactly fit this particular architecture. And uh, sometimes you also want to make use of multiple resources at once, and you don't want to change the definition of a workflow based on what resources you're going to run on. You want to have something that's abstract enough and portable across these resources. So, um, one of the approach that, that we've taken in our work is to uh, uh, put a workflow management system on this local resource that's available to the user. So it could be a laptop or um, um, a, a server or whatever. And then from this, uh, uh, this local resource, you can send directives to do work on the various uh, types of infrastructure and also to access data either from local storage or, or remotely. So the job of this workflow management system that, uh, that sits user side is to, first of all, discover what resources are available to the user in terms of uh, computation, data, software. And nowadays, you can also um, discover and manipulate uh, networks as uh, resources. And then uh, the job of a workflow management system is uh, based on this information to select the appropriate resources. Uh, and also take into account uh, what software is available on them, uh, the performance that they have, reliability, availability on cycles, and, and storage space, for example. And once you, you, you do the selection, you devise a plan of what resources to use, um, how to best adapt the workflow to the resources. So if you're running workflows that have different characteristics when the resources how to manipulate it. Um, what protocols to use to access the data and to schedule jobs since these various resources talk different ways. And also what data to save along the way. Uh, and once you have that plan, you basically execute it. So you execute it in a way that's reliable and in a way that keeps track of uh, what data was accessed uh, and uh, what they, how the data was generated uh, and where it's stored. And then, uh, at least in this work, we consider the actual resource provisioning. So if you run on the cloud, for example, and you want to provision the resources, this is um, outside of this um, work and management system function. Uh, so we've been uh, building the and uh, developing the Pegasus work and management system since 2001. Uh, it's a collaboration with uh, Miron Lidney from uh, HD Contour and University of Wisconsin-Madison. And our system is basically composed of uh, three different components. It has um, a workflow compiler or planner uh, that takes an abstract workflow description, uh, which is resource independent. So it basically talks about the science that the scientist wants to do and not the resources that we're going to use it to do it. Um, it also has auxiliary information and catalog, so what, re what uh, resources are available, uh, what data is available, where it resides where the codes are um, installed or where you can get them from and install them on the fly. And the output is an um, executable workflow which, which already has concrete resources described in it and uh, actual command lines that needs, need to be executed on these resources. Uh, as part of this compilation pro uh, process, uh, Pegasus also automatically locates physical location of uh, the task and the data. So it uh, basically decides uh, which data replica, for example, to access uh, during um, the computations. And it also transforms the workflow for performance and reliability, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, then once we have this workflow, we give it to the Dagman uh, workflow engine, uh, which uh, comes from HC Condor, and it uh, basically executes the workflow uh, based on what the description, whether it's local or distributed resources, and uh, also the individual tasks are managed by the uh, Congress KD, which is a, a queue manager that, schedule, that allows you to schedule jobs uh, to local remote resources and manages the execution. Uh, we also wrap the jobs in, uh, in our own Pegasus uh, Kickstart to get performance information during the execution. Uh, we also, uh, in addition to performance, we also collect provenance information, so how the data was derived. Um, especially as you will see, the workflow gets actually transformed during uh, the planning process 
So it's even harder for the user to see uh, how the, the particular data products was obtained if we don't provide this uh, performance the provenance information. And then we keep uh, uh, traces of the execution, uh, of course, and uh, we store the performance information in a database. Uh, if you look at uh, the um, abstract workflow, so this is a graphical description of a workflow. However, uh, Pegasus uh, represents the workflow in XML uh, natively, and then uh, we provide uh, different APIs in Java, Perl, Python, and recently R to generate these workflows. Um, this workflow is basically a two uh, job workflow that uh, has two tasks, hello and world. It takes fileapp.a and runs hello on it and then generates fileapp.b, which then world get, runs on and ge generates fileapp.c. Uh, so Pegasus takes the information from the various catalogs and creates this executable workflow that you see on the right. It first creates a di directory on the remote end, so it isolates the workflow execution. It uh, stages, adds a node to stage the file f.a from the source uh, where the f.a resided. It then invokes hello and world. In this case, it was executed on the same resource. If it, it was executed on two different resources, then it will add a stage, uh, um, a data transfer node between hello and world to move f.b to the right location. Then after world were executed, it will stage the results out um, to where the user wanted them to go, and it will register the data product so you can find them again. And so basically, this is like a basic type of a transformation that uh, Pegasus will do uh, to um, from an abstract description, which is resource independent, to something that has particular resources identified. Once the workflow runs, so during the running of the workflow, we can provide uh, different information uh, on the Pegasus dashboard. We show uh, the successful running and failed jobs. Uh, we can provide information about the, the time it took to execute different uh, components. You can look at jobs and runtime over time, or the uh, Gantt chart of different types of jobs that are running in the workflow. And then you can select different workflows uh, to do the analysis on. Uh, in addition to adjustment monitoring information, we also provide uh, statistics uh, on a particular workflow. So this is an astronomy workflow, which, uh, in which case we show the number of different types of uh, jobs that ran, the average run times, the average I.O. reads, and, and peak memory, and, and so forth. So this uh, helps the user understand the workflow, but also it can help us later on uh, decide what kind of resources the particular workflow needs. Uh, so, so this gives you a kind of a basic functionality of Pegasus. However, when we run in different uh, execution environments, we face different uh, challenges, and I'll describe some of them now. Uh, so some of them are due to failures in the execution environment, and that happens quite often when you look dealing with distributed systems. And now with high-performance systems uh, as well, we expect as the systems scale up, the failures on these systems will, will, grow, will increase. Uh, we also have data storage limitations at different execution sites. So the workflows are large and deal with terabytes of data. Sometimes they don't fit into the allocations that the users have. Uh, sometimes you deal with uh, issues of performance. So if you have lots of uh, short running tasks, for example, in the workflow, then the overhead of sending these tasks across the network and launching them and waiting at the remote end in a particular queue are very um, detrimental to the execution of the workflow. So we need to be able to deal with that. Uh, then the uh, computing platforms that we're executing on are also very heterogeneous. Uh, some have um, different types of file systems. Some have shared file systems. Some don't share any file system. And when you're talking about uh, uh, workflows where you need to share data between the computational components and you can do that, through file systems, and the, the lack of their office uh, is a problem. Uh, we also deal with different system architectures, so different Cray, Blue Jeans, and all these systems have different operating systems and support for different types of functionality. And then you have this mismatch that I showed before between the task, which can be a single core task, and the architecture, which can be an HPC type of cluster. Uh, and uh, so dealing with, I'm going to talk about dealing with these various problems. One is uh, dealing with failures. 
And but before I talk about that, one feature of Pegasus that uh, helps in that regard is that from the beginning it was designed to support data reuse. So if you're looking at a uh, project such as LIGO, which is a, a large scale collaboration where users already have potentially done part of analysis, such as you see here in this graph, somebody maybe already ran uh, components B and D and generated file f.d, which was and shared it with others through a data registry. Then if somebody else submits the same workflow to the system, we can detect that this file has, is already exists on the storage. And then we reduce the workflow so we don't have to, to compute uh, B, uh, do the computations B or D. We can just reduce the workflow to something simpler that simply retrieves file f.d from storage. Obviously, in some cases, it might be more beneficial in terms of performance to actually redo the computations rather than go to storage it. For example, this data resides somewhere on tape. Uh, so this type of data reuse, saving the data along the way and reusing it throughout the workflow allows us to do workflow level checkpointing. So now if you have a failure during execution, uh, then you can restart the workflow from where the failure took place. So you can retrieve the intermediate data product and you don't have to redo the entire workflow from the beginning. Uh, another issue that we deal with are storage limitations. And so <clears throat> we designed algorithms uh, that uh, go through the workflow before it's being uh, sent to for execution, and it, they look at when the data is no longer needed downstream. So when it's no longer needed, for example, file f.a once consumed by hello, uh, that data is not needed at the execution site, you can just uh, remove it and thus reduce the, the footprint of the workflow, and thus you can fit larger workflows in small space. So we um, evaluated the performance uh, of various algorithms, in particular uh, this particular algorithm for cleanup. You can see this is the execution for an astronomy workflow. This is uh, the graph shows the time in seconds and the amount of space taken uh, by the workflow in, in megabytes. In green, you have uh, the top line. It shows you the execution of a workflow without any cleanup. And the bottom line in blue shows the execution of a workflow if if you have cleanup along the way, and the cleanups are these little red dots. And you can see that you can reduce the footprint of a workflow from 1.25 gigabytes to 700 megabytes, and vice, you can fit the workflow into a tighter space. So we're quite um, uh, happy with that result. We tried to do it uh, on a small uh, LIGO workflow. So this, for illustration, we just use a, a LIGO workflow which has 166 nodes. Uh, however, as you know, these workflows uh, are larger than that. And the problem with these workflows, though, if we employ our algorithm, uh, is that uh, it br they bring in all the data at once, and then uh, they keep it around. And so you really cannot start cleaning up till most of the data is staged in. Uh, however, we looked at the workflow, particularly the small workflow, carefully, and we saw that there are some dependencies that we can introduce that would make the workflow smaller. So we took part of the workflow, put it on top of the rest. And we got a 26% improvement uh, in the amount of space that this workflow used. So basically, we, we kind of employed particular scheduling for workflow restructuring. And we restructured it further, and uh, we got a 56% improvement in the amount of space that, that, um, uh, that the workflow used. And so we talked to LIGO about this, who we were very happy. However, they looked at the workflow that we had as a result, and it looked nothing like the workflow that they designed. So that they didn't go with uh, our solution. So indeed, it was kind of uh, that was not a very successful uh, solution for this particular project. Um, another thing that, that you can do. Uh, so this shows you a, a, is a, a typical deployment uh, of Pegasus. So it lives on this user resource, which we call a submit host. This can also be a community resource. It submits jobs, let's say, to, to a head node of a particular Linux cluster, which has this limited file system. And it takes data from the input site and stages data to an output site. So what you can do here by, to expand this shared file system is to basically break this communication of tasks through the file system and introduce uh, basically kind of an intermediate data site, which uh, Pro provides this uh, temporary storage for intermediate data, which allows communication between the workflow task without going through, through a local uh, shared file system. 
So this supports not only the uh, increasing the amount of space that's available to the workflow, because you just bring in the data as needed for a particular task, but it also allows you to run across multiple sites. So you can uh, schedule workflows uh, across two HPC clusters, for example. And the other thing it also allows you to do is uh, to run across an uh, HPC cluster and also a, a cloud instance using, for example, in this case, an object store to, uh, to do the communications with, between files. Uh, in order to be able to support this type of communication for object stores, a different storage system, you need to have tools to allow you to talk between them. So we have a Pegasus uh, transfer system that uh, talks various protocols that are available on storage systems, so uh, GridFTP, uh, SRM, iRODs, it can talk to S3 uh, object store, Google storage, and the more common SCP, HTTP, and so forth. Um, it prioritizes uh, data transfers to um, achieve performance, and also has um, ability to transfer data between uh, non-compatible uh, protocols. So if a particular, if you want to transfer a site between GridFTP and Google storage, there's no protocol that allows you to talk between the two. Uh, but you can take uh, the good FTP, uh, use the good FTP to bring a file to your local system and then uh, push it out to, to Google storage. Um, another thing that uh, I mentioned is that we have a mismatch of workload uh, between uh, the definition of a workflow and the infrastructure that the workflows are running on. So this is a good example of that from uh, Earthquake Science. So this is uh, called the CyberShake workflow, which uh, calculates the amount of shaking that can be expected in Southern California uh, over the next uh, 50 years. And it basically uh, computes these various points on the map and then interpolates them over uh, to get uh, a map of uh, Southern California uh, earthquake uh, hazards. And this workflow, if you look at it, it's basically at the, to at the top level, it's two, two pieces. One is an MPI piece, which has uh, MPI codes to generate the meshes and do the initial simulation. And then you have, um, which is highly parallel, and then you have uh, many uh, hundreds of thousands of post-processing tasks uh, that are single core. Uh, that generate these um, accelerations, peak acceleration at the different um, at different locations. So in order to be able to deal with these type of uh, computations, we can obviously run the first part on an HPC cluster, and then uh, the second part on um, on high throughput type of computing resources. Uh, but uh, we can also sometimes run them within one uh, computing cluster because of the data transfer that you have between the um, MPI codes and the uh, high throughput computing codes. So some of the solutions that we have, uh, one is to uh, cluster test together. So this is, you can see an original workflow, which has, in this case, it's pretty regular. We, we have at the level, uh, the second level of the B jobs which can be clustered into larger holes and scheduled as one on the remote system. Uh, another thing you can do is to have pilot jobs and that you submit to, to the remote execution system. And then you put, uh, you basically, once they start running on that system, you send tasks to, to these pilots. So they run within this kind of, it's not exactly a container, but you can kind of think of that uh, in that way. And then you can also uh, partition the workflow and then treat parts of that workflow, the sub-workflow, as an MPI computation if you have um, a workflow execution engine that can execute this part of the workflow using MPI. And so we have this type of uh, engine for Pegasus. It's called the Pegasus MPI cluster. Um, it's basically a master worker type of scheduler that allows you to take um, um, take a part of that workflow and uh, one master would send off uh, jobs to, to, the, to the worker tasks uh, within this uh, MPI resource pool. And so this kind of gives you some idea of the type of optimizations and challenges that we deal with in the uh, current uh, computing systems, uh, heterogeneous systems. And I want to talk a little bit about the current directions and then some of the future stuff that we're looking at. So one of the uh, projects that uh, is uh, currently underway is the Panorama Project, which is funded by the Department of Energy. 
And uh, the goal of this project is to figure out how to develop analytical models that can predict the behavior of these uh, complex data-intensive workflows when they're executing on, on these various infrastructures. Uh, we want to find out what monitor information and uh, analysis is needed uh, to do performance prediction, not only performance predictions, but also anomaly detection. So how do we figure out during the execution of a workflow that something is going wrong and so we can um, uh, uh, basically uh, either adapt the workflow or abort it. So how would we do that during the execution is another question that we have. And then um, altogether, how do we automate the entire process of uh, developing this analytical models or using analytical models and then monitoring the execution and adapting the, uh, the execution as the workflow is progressing. So these are the, the key questions we want to answer. And we've been developing tools uh, that allow you to monitor the, the application execution, the workflow execution, and we extended our tools to also monitor MPI jobs and provide real-time reporting uh, of what's going on when the workflow is executing. And this is an example of uh, collecting information about the bytes written by uh, NAMD, which is a molecular dynamics uh, application. Uh, then we also uh, uh, use infrastructure monitoring uh, to, um, this is also, sorry, I want, meant to say, this is also the average CPU time uh, for the NAMD uh, computations that's um, uh, over simulated time. So we also have, um, this, uh, the infrastructure monitoring that it can uh, tell us the load on the system and uh, the network performance and so forth. And we use standard tools uh, to capture that information. So using these two informations, we can um, then train the system to look at the normal type of uh, performance. So this is the performance of this particular application that looks at um, the number of bytes written. And this is uh, captured at the workflow level. Uh, the, the I.O. weight uh, at the workflow, and then from the infrastructure we uh, collect the right bandwidth. So if this, is, this shows you a kind of a training run that we use for our anomaly detection algorithms, which um, in this case this is um, using autocorrelation to look at the expected performance uh, of this particular workflow. And then when we introduced uh, anomaly, so we injected an anomaly in this execution, we can see that uh, we detect uh, the anomaly is, uh, is captured by the instrumentation on the uh, infrastructure, but we also see this anomaly in our IO weight. And once we pass a particular threshold, uh, then uh, we can throw in, a, throw in um, a signal saying that an anomaly was detected. So this is um, a part of a project that uh, is ongoing. We're trying to, to look at different types of anomaly detection algorithms uh, and their performance. Um, and then uh, kind of looking uh, future, uh, into the future, we look at what, what are the application trends and how we need to um, basically keep on top of them and how we can uh, help these future applications execute in different environments. So one trend that we see is there is more need for data management. So basically even simple things like collecting and archiving data from sensors and instruments is something that um, scientists do struggle with. Um, the kind of the laptop science that has been employed by many scientists up to now is just not keeping up with the trends of uh, increased data uh, collection uh, by the different instruments that are out there. Uh, it also brings uh, the issue of uh, having more live data processing, so the analysis of this instrumental data on the fly. Uh, potentially comparing that uh, to the simulation that's running, predicting the performance um, of, for example, a particular material, how the material will behave. So the scuffling of um, instruments and simulation is another issue that we, we see uh, coming down the line. And also the coupling of simulation with data mining and visualization, which also needs to be done uh, more closely for these large scale applications. Um, another trend that we see is uh, uncertainty quantification type of applications where you basically sweep, search for a large uh, parameter space and uh, you, you see, uh, you, you explore it uh, through multiple workflows and so these work on ensemble, so that's something that uh, we also need, a need see a need for. And then big data applications uh, as well, which have their own 
uh, type of uh, internal mechanisms for um, of mechanisms such as Hadoop and others for processing, but how do we also tie them into the larger whole of what the scientist needs to do? And then uh, on the technology side, uh, we see that the systems are becoming much more heterogeneous, even the HPC systems. Um, now they're predicted to have billions, the exascale systems being built are predicted to have billions of elements. They'll have uh, CPUs, GPUs, uh, potentially also have PGAs. Um, there are also novel I.O. solutions, such as burst buffers, um, that provide uh, new opportunities for data management. And in general, uh, the data management within the system uh, is getting much more expensive within HPC systems. So, you, uh, and it's expensive both in terms of time and in terms of power. So, uh, we need to be able to carefully coordinate the data movement within a HPC platform. And uh, we need to um, develop basically new algorithms that, that take account of this kind of higher cost in terms of time and, and uh, performance. Um, also, uh, when you start coupling these uh, simulations and visualization uh, or simulation and um, uh, data mining uh, within the HPC system, you may not want to go all, all the time to the file system to, uh, to do the communication. So looking at kind of in situ computations that couple these two in memory um, is something that uh, I think is uh, interesting uh, to look at. And also, to when you're doing that, to decide what data to keep, because the amounts of data that are generated that can be quite large. And obviously, uh, issues of faults uh, that are coming into the HPC world as well is something that um, uh, is uh, kind of in our fu future outlook. And uh, looking at issues of uh, checkpointing, which can be expensive, versus uh, kind of uh, looking at robust in situ um, engines uh, can be uh, a, a future direction. And so, um, what, what we want to do in this space, so we want to look at this uh, more in development of an uh, in-situ um, workflow engines and potentially building on the Pegasus MPI cluster, um, looking at different communication channels within HPC, such as memory or burst buffers, and how to use them during the workflow execution. Uh, I think another thing that uh, has been getting a lot of traction lately is the issue of um, reproducibility of the results. Um, if you cannot reproduce, or maybe the transparency, so can you show how you obtain the results? And the issue of reuse, how can you reuse somebody else's work? And so we want to, in this area, we want to explore how we can capture uh, the information, quantify it, and publish a workflow in a way that's re reusable and reproducible by others. Um, we also want to look at this, uh, what uh, some call the long tail of science. So how do you, uh, those kind of laptop scientists, how do you make it easier uh, for them to, to do the work for composition and set up and still make use of these various resources beyond the laptop to, to do the work. Uh, and uh, as I already mentioned, some of the classes of applications we want to look at, so streaming data, uncertainty quantification type of uh, applications. Uh, I think uh, um, will be becoming more important in the workflow sphere. And then uh, uh, finally, there are also issues uh, of um, data and computation, privacy and security, which are also becoming more important. So uh, that's uh, something that the uh, future direction for us to pursue. Okay, and if you want to, um, so this basically gave you an overview of uh, Pegasus, uh, some of the challenges that we face when we execute workflows uh, on different uh, platforms, and um, some of the research directions that we want to pursue in the future. Uh, and uh, basically, if you want to learn more about uh, our work, we have a Pegasus website which uh, talks about the various uh, the software, uh, provides you uh, documentation, we want to try things out, uh, we have mailing lists and chat rooms for support. Uh, we also have a set of uh, papers that, that you can read. Um, and uh, also we support uh, visits from different scientists and, and students uh, at ISI. So if you ever want to come to visit us uh, that, and work with us, that, that would be great as well. Uh, thank you.